Last year was the um, first time that we had the, had the pleasure of James O.D. with us, and it was an extraordinary experience. His background is, is one of, of action in the world. He was former Washington Director of Amnesty for Peace, which has taken him all over the world in very difficult kind of situations. He was CEO of the SEVA Foundation, some of which you know much about that. He was, has been the past president of Institute of Noetic Sciences, so he has that kind of experience. He's also, I'm not sure if James would agree with this, but he is a, he's a mystic in many ways, uh, combining action in the world with, a, with, with an extraordinary sensitivity and heart. So as he, as he is with us, we are in the field that he creates, uh, which is something of, something of rare beauty. He is, uh, you saw one of his books in the bookstore, Creative Stress, and his latest book, Cultivating Peace, will be available on Amazon, right? It's coming soon, at least from your website, right. in May. So we can look forward to that. I could say more, but um, you will much more enjoy hearing from James O'Dee. Thank you for joining us, James. Thank you. I'm going to begin here and uh, do a little prologue to my talk. My talk is called The Seven Initiations of the Sacred Activist and the Peacemaker. But I wanted to begin here at this statue of Jesus, and I wanted to share with you a little of Jesus as I have come to experience him and why it's a fitting prologue to a talk on sacred activism. Detrahem Lamaria Allahak. Love your God. Minkula Lebeik with all your heart. Minkula Nafshak with all of your animal instinct, menkula ruhianak, with all of your spiritual nature, detraham lahriabak aiknafshak, and love the one who is your neighbor as you love your own instinctual self. Detraham lahriabak. Aiknakshak. Detraham Lamaria Allahak. Minkula Labek. Minkula Hayak. Minkula Nafshak. Minkula Ruhianak. Detraham Lahriabak. Aiknafshak. So when I, when I encountered Jesus in the Aramaic, I said, I know you. I know your fire, I know your passion, I know your ecstatic being, I know your nature. What so troubled me as a child was inheriting the crucified, the beaten, the wounded, which so much of my life, my life's work, taking me to the troubled spots, the wounded place of the world, to see and to feel that Jesus and not know the one who said those words, not feel that essence of ecstatic nature. Minkula lebeik with all your heart, minkula nafshak with all your animal instinct, minkula hayak with all your life force, minkula ruhianak with all of your spiritual being. And so I came to know Krishna as this guiding archetype of my work through the world, through the massacres in Beirut, through Rwanda, through all of those places that I went, as Krishna for me, the dark, deep, blue Krishna who has swallowed the poison of the world, picks up the flute out of that poison and plays the flute 
and turns the poison into music. And so the vision I had the other day is my mantra has been Yeshua Krishna, Yeshua Krishna, Yeshua Krishna. And the image that came to me was of Jesus, the wounded one, taking all of this wounding and suffering in the world and invisibly to the world behind him was Krishna picking up the flute as Jesus entered the cosmos, becoming the cosmic Christ. And that flute of Krishna playing all the way deep into the deepest heart of human suffering, all the way with the joyful note, with the bittersweet truth that we shall in the end inherit the joy. So the seven initiations of the sacred activist and the peacemaker. And I don't have to say to this group, life is a journey of initiations, one after the other, cyclical, recurrent initiations, deepening initiations. And so the first initiation of the sacred activist and the peacemaker is the initiation of inspiration. And of course, it's a deepening initiation ritual, isn't it, inspiration? I remember in my own process that some of my inspiration came from outrage, from deep moral outrage. The problem with that kind of inspiration is it loses oxygen. You burn out. You are looking at someone who's burnt out of moral outrage. There isn't a drop of it left in me. Well, maybe a little. <laughs> the inspiration that comes from the conditioned mind, from family inheritance, from social rituals, from social and religious connections. So we're in that journey can we go? If inspiration is the necessary catalyst for insight and action, that's what we're looking at with inspiration, the necessary catalyst for insight and action. Where do we go in our journey of initiations? We go to the door of essence, don't we? And inspiration is always coming through the door of essence to us, to our essential nature, calling in the words and in the codes of our soul's call code, asking us to be essentially who it was that we were born to be. Do we really believe that is true, that inspiration is always there, always knocking at that door of your essence, and how easily it is deflected. How I don't quite have time for that, or not that, or I'm sorry I can't hear that call. But those who do live as the paradigm of human evolutionary process, don't they? They commune with the universe itself, which goes instantaneously. This isn't a long, difficult process of I've got to do my inspiration homework. <laughs> this is the universe coming right to your heart, to your heart, mind, body, and knocking at your door and saying, only you have these qualities. Only you have this opportunity. It is you I am calling. Do you hear me? And so often through the conditioned self, through the distracted self, we fail to hear, we fail to hear that voice. But when we do, whew, we see what a human being is. Devota in Rwanda, who feels 
instantaneously at one point, about a year after both of her children have been murdered, one of them hacked to death in front of her, when she herself is bearing and still bears deep, deep machete wounds across her body. Her body is a map of, of machete hacking that she survived. And she feels the inspiration, the call, to go and forgive the murderers of her children. And she does it. She does it. The Shahaks in Israel, whose 15-year-old daughter is blown up in a terrorist bomb. And when I was with the Shahaks in Israel, they told me, look, we were a conservative family. We're not involved in politics. We were certainly not in any way connected to the Palestinian issue. And our daughter was blown up, a 15-year-old daughter blown up. How do you find inspiration there? But a little while after her murder, they're cleaning out her room. They found her diary. And in her diary, it said, I dream of peace with the Palestinians. They had no idea that this is what her, their daughter was writing in her diary. I dream of peace with the Palestinians. And the universe, again, coming all the way through to see if they're open to the possibility that they too could dream of peace with the Palestinians. What an invitation, what a breakthrough for inspiration to come that far and to be so broken open by life's experience and so ready that they took it. They walked into the door of essence, into their essence. They reached out to Israeli and Palestinian families and created the Bereaved Family Forum. If you're in as much pain as we are in, let's change the story, they said. Wow. Can you imagine that depth of inspiration? Ari Ariatni, Dr. Ariatni, the founder of the Sarvodia movement in Sri Lanka, is beginning to organize demonstrations between the Hindus and the Buddhists, the Tamils and the Sinhalis in Sri Lanka. And it's in the early phase of that movement. And word gets out that he's organized a huge peace rally. And he hears that there's a, well, let's call him a boss mafioso, boss type, who doesn't want this. This is not in his interest. And he gets, the, wor the word gets to Ari Ariadne. If you proceed with the demonstration tomorrow, you may be shot at the demonstration. Inspiration comes to the heart of Ari Ariadne in that moment, instantly. And do you know what he does? He goes to the house of the one who he, f he hears is pro proposing to have him murdered. And he shouts outside the house, Hello! I hear you're going to have me murdered. Well, why don't you do it now? Because if you do it tomorrow, you'll create chaos. There'll be riots. Many people will die. It will be a terrible disorder. So just take me. Take me now. Listen to that inspiration. Listen to the power of soul's code, soul's purpose, meeting the voice of the Creator, the po most powerful voice in the universe, coming through His embodiment in this way. And He waits, and He waits outside the house, and slowly He can't see anybody, but the door of the house swings open. <laughs> And he knows this is it. And he steps inside that house. The man in that house becomes his follower. The man inside that house 
is so blown away by this level of inspiration that he becomes Dr. Ariadne's follower. Are you ready to be inspired? Are you ready to be inspired at this level where you commune with your own essence, recognize that you too are given the call? The second initiation of the sacred activist and peacemaker is, com is commitment. And as I said, these, these all come back at different and deepening levels in our lives. Commitment, the confirmation that comes through testing. So if inspiration is the catalyst for both insight and action, commitment is the confirmation that comes through testing. And it brings that confirmation all the way into the heart, doesn't it? goes right into the heart's root and it says, I know this is mine to do. And for so many of us, the great discernment is not running around doing this and that for everybody and following every impulse, but to really know what is it that I have been called to do, that I have been given to do. And when we have that knowing experience, we experience the ring of truth in our being. We say, I am worthy. I know this in the core of my being. I have an essence in my being and it knows that I have been given this to do, whatever its scope or scale. This is where the mystery of faith really resides, isn't it? It's when you in the first case, you hear the call, the invitation from the universe, and then you hear the confirmation, and you acknowledge the confirmation in this commitment process. That is the essence of faith. And it's not deflected by linear objection. Oh, don't you love linear objection? Well, James O.D., you haven't tied your shoelaces. I know. That was always a problem. <laughs> James O'D., your shirt is hanging out. You haven't tied your shoelaces. Go to the back of the class. You're a crackpot. One of my teachers called me a crackpot. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> this is what happened to the crackpot. <laughs> but linear objection can get oh so much more devious. What haven't you thought about this, that if you had thought about it, you'd really be in a position that I'm in to tell you not to do it? It's everywhere. And where does linear objection come from? It comes from the heart of the cynic. Cynicism is ripe in our time, isn't it? And who is the cynic? The cynic is us. The cynic is the one who's wounded who really heard the call and said, I don't have time. Please don't invite me, universe, to that. <laughs> and it tastes bitter when you refuse the universe and when you know that you refuse the universe. You get the inversion. Instead of commitment, you get raiding commitment, laughing at commitment, scorning it in others. So let's have compassion for the cynic. Because the cynic is a wonderful idealist. It's a wonderful being who was invited to the dance and learned later that maybe they should have said yes. And commitment is not about tactics. It's not about inflexibility. It's about vision, about being informed by vision and knowledge. It's not renewed by duty or compulsion, but by living vision, living enthusiasm 
entheosiasm, enthusiasm, this word that has the theo in it, the, the divine, it's divine enthusiasm. It said, I got an assignment. Thank God for something to do. Thank you for this service. It has that in Theo, that divine enjoyment of the purpose, however big it is. In Dr. Ari Ariyatni's case, he created Sarvodhya Shramadana, this incredible movement in Sri Lanka that based on development process, based on Buddhist and spiritual principles, bringing all kinds of opposing forces together, and all of the long years of work that commitment can give you when you really follow it through from that first inspiration. Wilberforce, I love the life of Wilberforce because he had that pers persistence, that tenacity. He had the vision, he was guided by the vision. He wasn't guided by the strategy because if he was, he, he would have given up because the strategy and the tactics had to keep changing, didn't they? Try this way to abolish slavery. Try that way. No, it doesn't work. In the end, you know how it, how it happens. Through clever parliamentary process. Devious parliamentary process, actually. So it, he constantly was looking at this and that way and moving the game forward, but guided by that vision, accepting that inspiration, living the whole wholeness of the vision, not the, I'm in love with this tactic and I'm going to put everything into this tactic and then when it doesn't happen, I give it up. How many of us have done that? We fall in love with the part that we think is the, I've got the way to do it. I've got the way to save the world. Oh dear. <laughs> in my own case, my commitment, I had a deep experience of commitment in Turkey and it was after an evening I was, I'd had a beer in the town of Izmir in Turkey and I had missed the little collective taxi that went directly to the Izmir Collegiate Institute where I was teaching and I was walking through the marketplace when there was some fighting going on and it seemed like quite a large mob of students were from the left and the right were really going at each other. So I slid into a side alley and then into a doorway and I waited a long, long time because I knew it didn't feel good. And then when I thought the coast was clear and everything was quiet, I came out of the side street onto the main artery of the marketplace and there right in front of me were five men and they immediately thought that I was a straggler from the group that they'd been fighting. And they came at me and one of them had a knife and um, it was some, something of a Celtic whirling dervish at the time. I, you know, the knife was coming at me and I was spinning and trying to push the people away and protect my life. And gradually they tightened the noose and the jabs went in along my leg and up my side and down my arm and I started to lose quite a bit of blood. I was weak enough that they got me against the wall, and got a knife right up against my heart and uh, I, I squeaked out, I'm English, English, because I had at first been speaking in Turkish uh, even though I was new to Turkish, I was saying the wrong things. I was saying words that sounded like, well, this is not my fight or I'm not a part of this, but I was trying to communicate I was a foreigner. And then this big, burly character pushed the man with a knife away and he said, you English? <laughs> and even though I was really in a very sorry state, I said, well, no, actually, I'm Irish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they started to move away and they ran away and I 
stumbled along the street and bleeding and losing too much blood and I collapsed in the street and you know this conference is about angels this angel in the night came for me and he he picked me up and he put me in his car and he drove me to the public hospital where he pulled me out of the car and simply left me on the street in front of the hospital and drove away to this day you know I say thank you whoever you were angel of the night mysterious being you saved my life but the experience that that experience gave me an incredible sense of moment of okay Turkey's really unsafe and <laughs> things are falling apart the left and the right are fighting each other I think I need to get out of here when when the heart said no this is really your time to stay to show your students that you're not going to run away from this that education is now you have you have something that's opened up literally inside of you to educate about you you can be more real you've been at the edge of death you can be more true it was an incredible sense and I think many of us in this room must have had these experiences not necessarily knifing but that moment when the heart goes into its knowingness when just like we receive that invitation to be who we've been called to be then that next chord that says ah it's just getting interesting <laughs> this assignment you've given me on planet earth Mandela, Mandela in prison. Such a story of commitment to his own being, to the quality of his being. This is the essential story, isn't it? That we have the universe's showering qualities and each one of us is a matrix or design of some of those qualities, a unique matrix or design of some of those qualities. We get to live and inhabit those. And in, Gan, in, in Mandela's case, it was this quality of being that was always reverential to others. You see, you've seen him, so you know it. It's in his frequency. And so the, the guards, after years and years of in prison, the guards themselves around Mandela started to be transformed by his steadfastness, his ability to live in that state of commitment to who he was and not become other than that. The third initiation is into creativity. And if commitment is the confirmation that comes through testing, sometimes really deep testing, creativity is the flow that is experienced from the conjunction of inspiration and commitment. Let me say that again. Creativity is the flow that is experienced from the conjunction of inspiration and commitment. It is as if we are communing constantly in communion and conversation with our own higher purpose. Creativity is not an outcome but a way of sourcing guided action from the ground of being. We can indeed be challenged in the creative mode. It's not about not everything suddenly goes, you know, all Pollyanna and beautiful. Even in this state when things are flowing, we can be challenged, but we are, the flow itself is unstoppable. Even our challenges are simply feedback. They're just another form of feedback. Oh, so that's how you feel. We gain energy mastery. We gain what Gurdjieff referred to as the law of reciprocal maintenance. We see that, in fact, 
it's always a creative flow of I give and I receive and creativity stops if you keep giving, doesn't it? If you become that obsessive servant of I always have to be serving you and doing for you. And again, the oxygen runs out there. Craig Kilberger is such an example of this. How many people know of his work? Not so many. He created an organization at age 12 called Free the Children. He was inspired by Iqbal Masi. Iqbal Masi, who at age six was at age, at age five, was shackled to a loom in Pakistan as part of the carpet industry. At age eight, he had broken free and, bec and started becoming a human rights activist for children imprisoned in the carpet industry in Pakistan, Iqbal Masi. At age 11, we helped with many, many voices get him the Human Rights Award from Reebok. He got the age 11, the Reebok Human Rights Award. And at age 12, he was murdered. And Craig Kielberger in Canada, the same age, age 12, became so inspired. It was like, like Iqbal had passed him the torch. And he picked it up. He immediately said to his parents, you know, I want to do something in this case. He, he wrote a letter to the Canadian government. They ignored him, and he didn't like that as a 12-year-old. And he persisted until he met with the prime minister. Then he told his parents that he wanted, you know, that he wanted to visit other heads of state around the world. But he had to get on with this. You know? And you know, at, from age 12 on, he created this incredible organization called Free the Children, working on behalf of children around the world. He's now in his 20s, and he's created an organization, I think it's called From Me to We, Me to We. He still, they still have Free the Children, but Me to We is again mobilizing young people to say, this is the time of we. This is truly the time of we, isn't it? I mean, when we really understand it, it is the time when everywhere I turn is the face of my teacher. That's the, that's the day we're living in. And so an organization that really mobilizes young people to say, it is us. It is us together as the evolutionary force, as the voice of conscience in our time. What a powerful, powerful experience. What is freed in creativity is the moral imagination. When we really realize that in fact we are beings who draw so deeply from this fountain of deep imagination, that it's open to us to transform and change the world through the power of imagination. And it's that excitement and imagination that you see in Craig Kilber's life. It's not, gee, I have to do something about this. Isn't it awful what they're doing to children? You get that get that sense in some of the ways people tackle service like, OK, I'll do it, rather than that enthusiasm, that connectivity that creates the flow. The fourth initiation is integration. The balance achieved when inner and outer are brought into alignment. Aha. How many times do we have that initiation? We think, ah, yes, I did my meditation. I'm going to go out and act in the world. And then we get the universe is full of feedback mechanisms, isn't it? Still got a little ego to sandpaper down here, have we? Still think it's all about you saving the world. 
kind of balance in this initiation is a new level of both grounded and lofty. Don't ever let them take the lofty away, that cynical disposition, that, cyn that hurt cynicism tries to cut the, the loftiness at the kneecaps, doesn't it? And in fact, sometimes it uses that expression, you know, why don't you get grounded? Get grounded from people who've never tasted the essence of Mother Nature's wildness? Get grounded? No. I shall be earthy and lofty. As my grandmother, Granny Breen, used to say, have roots and stars. Have roots and stars. This kind of integration is skillful balancing and even high wire balancing, right? It's not necessarily, integration is not, again, just like creativity is full of challenges and you move and you start to dance with those challenges, integration is not static. It's not like, okay, I got integrated, now everything's fine. Here are the 10 steps to integration, you can do it too. It can be a high wire act of integration because now you are really balanced, really balanced between the inner and the outer. You're surrendered. Your consciousness is so awakened that it sees the nature of Shakti arising. It sees the ocean of karma bubbling and it knows where am I to take my next step? That, that knowing process of integration, of not overestimating anything, of being in the present. Integration and being in the present are so connected. The rational and the, the intuitive are brought together. There is deep self-care as part of this design, deep self-care in integration. It's not that running around like a chicken without a head, which is not really going to help the universe too much. That sense of being the change, of being the change that you represent in the world. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, so many people who represent this. I want to tell you about somebody who is not famous, who represented this level of integration. A friend of mine who is professor of peace studies at American University, and actually quite a, an accomplished Sufi master, a great deep soul, Abdul Aziz Saeed, was told me that he had gone to a military camp, I, I forget which one it was, Fourth Leavenworth or one of those, and he was to be there for a few days to give some talks and from the professor of international relations perspective, I think more than the Sufi one. And uh, they assigned him a sergeant who was to take care of him. And during the two days that they were together, Abdul Aziz noticed this being was deeply integrated, was very conscious, was fully aware in every moment what was around him, who needed what, what needed to be done. Deeply connected and deeply emotionally sensitive at the same time. Really that balance, that integration that we get called to as an initiation again and again. Finally, just before they were leaving, Abdul Aziz said, well, look, you know, I've met many very deeply spiritual per people on, on the planet and deeply integrated people, but you are really quite an example and I'd love to know what your spiritual practice is that keeps you this conscious and attentive in each moment. And the soldier said, I was in Vietnam and I had mind duty. 
And I had to take one step and check. Maybe this would be my last step in life. And then I would take another step and maybe have to take out a mine. And he said, I learned so much from that experience. I learned that in every moment, you can live as if this is your last step, as if the universe has given you this moment to live and to be aware and to appreciate and to look at the world. Wow. You want to try that for a few days? <laughs> try that level of bringing the inner and the outer together in presencing and awareness and consciousness. It takes a few levels of initiation <laughs> to get to that degree of integration, where you truly presence and appreciate each moment. The fifth initiation is power. The alignment of purpose or will and integration to express a natural authority directed towards the highest good. Let me say that one again. Power, the initiation of power, is the alignment of purpose or will. And I love what was said this morning around will. When will is really understood, it is surrender. It is going with the story, the highest story. The alignment of purpose or will and with integration to express a natural authority directed towards the highest good. This is the area where so much initiation needs to happen in our time. There are so many uninitiated men, particularly, running around abusing power because they've never been initiated into that natural authority that comes when you align the inner and the outer, when you are aligned with who you are and what you are supposed to be doing. The problems, the chaos created by people who are not integrated and handling lots of power. Trumped up authority, no pun intended. Hint, <laughs> hint. <laughs> Hired by ego, fired by ego. <laughs> Your casinos will fall. Your monuments to greed will be released and reduced to dust. Mean-spirited politicians, you will taste bitterness. Fanatical terrorists, you will see what the seeds of hatred look like. Corporate plunderers of the earth who have reaped more destruction than any barbarian horde ever did, you will fall to your knees. You see, power calls out the prophetic voice, doesn't it? It says, hey, I have some authority to speak here. This is false. False positives. False reality, cheating, manipulation, demeaning each other. It is despicable. It is dehumanizing. You will taste bitterness. This is true power. It's what, you know, Gandhi called, you know, speaking truth to power. Satyagraha, the liberating force of, of truth. But that's only one part of the prophetic voice, isn't it? And we've got a little bit locked into that aspect of it, at least some of us have. But there's another part of the prophetic voice that is equally powerful, that is so needed. Out of the rod of Jesse shall arise. Look, behold, see who's coming. I tell you, those of you who have created this chaos, that a generation is coming that will shine a light of conscience to this world, that will shine creativity like you've never seen before. 
Are you calling them forth? Are you witnessing them? Are you calling this generation? You who are in your prophetic aging years, I ask you, yes, let us use the prophetic voice that says, this will fall. This we know will fall. For it is plundering our planet. It is destroying our climate out of greed. This we know will fall. And this we know will arise. Truth is so much beauty and truth is on its way. The healing will come. And the greatest power that I can attest to in my life, the greatest power is healing. That we have a power to heal. And the root of the word heal is to make whole beyond our imagination. I've seen Holocaust survivors forgive their Nazi persecutors. I've seen people in Rwanda forgive those who butchered their children. We have a power to heal. We are so fixated with punishment. And yet this power of healing, it is the essence of evolutionary process, isn't it? It says, you know, for whatever reasons we learn the way we learn. That seems to be part of the game. It's, we, we fumble along <laughs> in our learning process. But it's okay, it's really okay, even that which feels totally not okay. Ultimately, it is okay if we heal. If we turn and we heal ourselves, if we forgive ourselves, if we forgive those who did terrible things to us. We transform the story. We align with telos, with purpose in creation. We again start to commune with the purpose of creation by healing the story, don't we? We say, okay, we went, we did terrible things, but we're back. We're back, we're coming back together. We're uniting our communities. We're living sustainably. We're eating sensibly. We're appreciating our diversity. It's okay. The story can heal. And in fact, those of us who do this work know that it is a healing story. That of all the stories, it's a healing story. And, and we honor the power of the wounded healer. We honor the ones who have been broken open and who rise out of their brokenness to say, look, this is how you do it. You've had Azim Kamisa here. This is how you do it when your son has been murdered delivering pizza. You forgive the child on the other end of the gun because there are victims on both sides of the gun. This is power. This is where power resides, the power to heal. Sixth initiation, we're getting there. You become a transformational being. When your inner life and action in the world are synchronized in right action, your power is harnessed for the common good. You transform the gross into the subtle. You are a sacred activist. You are sacred activists. You use the power of love, gratefulness, and forgiveness to transform hurt and hostility. Like Albi Sachs in South Africa. I know two people in South Africa who lost one eye and one hand, one arm in letter bombs. One was Father Michael Lapsley, who then went on to create the Institute for the Healing of Memory. The other was the famous Albi Sachs. And during the truth and reconciliation process, Albi Sachs met the man who tortured him. 
And after he had lost this eye and arm, he got a note from friends who said, we will avenge you. And he said publicly, nobody avenges in my name. And then when he met his torturer, he had to extend his left hand because he didn't have the other hand. But he did. He extended it to his torturer. And um, it was reported afterwards that the, this man cried convulsively for about a week after this encounter. encounter. And Albie Sack said, this is vengeance. This is soft vengeance. This is healing vengeance. This is the way to do vengeance. How much more satisfying, he said, it is that I got to experience his tears than he got sent away for prison, to prison for years, and I never saw that transformation. That is tra that's being a transformational being. It's taking the raw and soft uh, and the raw and crude energy of the world and literally transmuting it, changing it, transforming it in the field of action. This is where you start to turn the tide of history. You who are emerging transformational beings will turn the tide of history. The generation that is to come will turn the tide of history because you become the source of inspiration for others. Wow. Now uh, inspiration is not abstracted, but it is you yourself are so aligned with evolutionary purpose, with divine will and intent, that you become a transformational being and others are deeply inspired by your life. Here, meaning is literally alive with life-giving power. Your words have life-giving power. Unlike the demagogue who creates chaos through ego, you create co coherence through humility and masterful service. Like Gandhi and so many others, you can stand in the fire of amnesty and say not only that he bore no enmity, but he would, to the extent possible, avoid creating embarrassment for those who are impressing him, oppressing him. It was one of Gandhi's tenets, you know. Try, try not to embarrass those who are oppressing you. Because what you want to do is live in that transformational state where you're always taking that, you're not riding and getting hooked on that energy, you're taking that energy and transforming it. You who abuse me, I will show you what respect looks like so that you will learn respect. So your mirror neurons will tune into respect. So you'll experience it fully. And obviously, don't look to the headlines for these transformational beings like Azim and so many others. So many I know who are transformational beings who are hidden from the cameras of the world. And uh, one of those is a soldier, who was a soldier in Israel. And he was out on patrol, and there was some shooting, and everybody got activated. And their little platoon started to break down, smash down doors and search houses for suspected terrorists. And in this case, he was with a small group. They smashed the door down. They went in. His colleagues were running through the house. Women were screaming. And he turned, and there were three children standing against the wall. And he said he was completely caught. In fact, it was the universe giving him an epiphany he looked at these three children. They were 12, 9, 7, about those ages. And he said they were statues. They were statues of hatred. There was pure hatred coming from their eyes. They were cold. They were not intimidated by soldiers and machine guns. They stood there as pictures of hatred. And in his deepest knowing, which he listened to, 
That's the trick, isn't it? In his deepest knowing, which he listened to, he said, if there is hatred in the eyes of the children, it is over. You can't win this story. If the children are showing hatred in their eyes, you have to change this story. And as quickly as he could, he left the military. He actually found himself for a while working alongside, because he needed work, alongside Palestinians in construction jobs. And then because he was a musician, he started to practice more his flute and other instruments. And you know what he does today? He plays the flute and the didgeridoo at elementary schools all over the place. And he shows a picture of himself with the you know, big gun. And now what he's doing, like the Krishna story, he's changed the story to world music, to playing the music for children. That a soldier who could you know, come from that level of transformation in a, in a period of a year is remarkable, isn't it? And yet, those are the transformational powers and capacities that we have. We can talk all as long as we like about the great masters of wisdom, and, and there are many of them, and we adore them. <laughs> but let's look for those transformational beings all around us who are changing the tide of history. And finally, the seventh initiation, the sacred activist and the peacemaker, is to be fully seated in peace consciousness. When ego is mastered, all action issues from the love and wisdom inherent in the ocean of pure consciousness. We are fully seated in peace consciousness. I know that I am peace. I know that I am peace. You cannot rile me. You cannot push me towards vengeance. I have entered that state. My consciousness is seated in peace. Do you know that in yourself? Have you experienced that? It is a profound state where being and knowledge, where knowing and being commune together to tell us this is where you are. I love this quote from Thomas Merton. To allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything, is itself to succumb to the violence of our times. Frenzy destroys the inner capacity for peace. It destroys the fruitfulness of our work because it kills the root of inner wisdom which makes our work fruitful. <sighs> Yay, Thomas. I hear an amen. Yes. The great journey from knowing what it is that you're given to do which is so important to now knowing who it is you truly are, knowing the depth of your being as peace, as love, knowing that you cannot be roused to anger or imprisoned by guilt or shame, that the seas of boiling energy can thrash around you, but they can never pull you back into their karmic surge and swell. Bye-bye, karma. <laughs> Once you step into those oceans, you, you're back in your karmic story. You're, you're doing good for everybody, and you're such a saint, but really, you've got some work to do. And at this point, you may even become invisible. It's like, you know, Harry Potter, who had the cloak of invisibility. Harry. Potter, <laughs> Hari Om, sacred Potter. Aha. 
But we can see that invisibility when we've arrived in that. We can see that invisibility in others. We can see when it's not creating that karmic ping pong, the karmic resonances. So we are arriving at the end of the story, and since I'm Irish, I have to tell you a little about story about Ireland. Well, actually, it, this, this story is a, quickly about Polly, my mother. My mother's name was Polly, and the other person in the story is Nellie. And Polly, this is, this is true, a few days ago, my sister, who's in Sweden, sent me an email and she said, you know, I've been digging up some of mom's old letters and my mother was a copious letter writer and long and full of instruction and wisdom and, and dreams. She always shared her dreams and in this, this was a snippet of a dream that she shared in her letter. And she said, I was going through the bog, the French's bog it's called, near Granny Breen's cottage. And that's where I used to visit her. Granny Breen was her mother. And she said, I had my new suit on. And it was so beautiful. It was white with black edging. And it was just so fashionable. And then I tripped and I fell in the bog. And I was solid mud. And she said, you know what? I stood up and I laughed. And I laughed. And the story about Nellie is that Nellie was a wonderful woman. My sons and I were in England, and Nellie and Peter. Peter is the best fly fisherman in Ireland, by the way. And Nellie and my three sons and I went punting in Oxford on the river. And uh, at one point, Nellie departed. <laughs> You know what a punt is. You, you stand up and you, you do this, you see. So Nellie was standing up and holding too tight to the punt. And off she went as, the, as our punt went in this direction. And for a moment, it seems as if she was going to defy the laws of physics. Because here she was holding in the water the pump, the, the, the oar. But the laws of physics won. And, smack down into the water she went. And uh, it looked pretty terrifying for a moment, but my sons pulled her bedraggled body <laughs> back into the punt. And as she lay in the bottom of the punt, she started to laugh. She started to laugh so deeply. Just like my mother rising out of the bog. And I say to you, whatever comes your way, whatever bog you meet, whatever river you fall into, may you rise out of it laughing. May you experience the joy that I experience having walked through a world crowded with suffering, a world full of poisonous devastating devastation. Yet I am in this place where I experience the joy, where I see the joy, where I know the laughter. The fundamentalists are not having fun. They really are not. <laughs> but we who are in the story of healing are having a great time. Thank you so much. Thank you.